This morning, I want to tell you that God has a plan for your life. Each one of us has been created for a reason. You were not meant to sit on the sidelines watching athletes play the game of life. You have a purpose. God knows it. The enemy knows it. I know it. And if you didn't know it, you know it now. You have a purpose. God created you with a purpose. We have to stand our ground because the enemy is looking for a way to take us out. He's looking to destroy your potential. And he does it by, by lying to us trying to convince us that we don't need God. And then when we mess up because we're, we're doing things on our own, then he condemns us and, tell us and tells us that we're not enough. See what he does? He tries to convince us that we don't need God, and then when we start trying to do it on our own, see, you're not good enough. When the reality is, is that yes, we're not good enough. We need God in our lives. We need his love. We need his grace. We need his forgiveness. We need his truth. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us, to lead us, to guide us, to convict us, and to teach us. This morning, we're going to talk about going to God with the right heart. Go into God with the right heart. You know, when we take a look, we see that we are not perfect. In fact, there is nothing that we could do to earn perfection. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 8 and 9 say that God saved you by His grace when we believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done so that no one, none one of us can boast about it. So when we mess up, when we sin, when we fall short of what we know is right, what do we do about it? What do we do when, 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 we, when that happens? Do we ignore it? When, when I've, I've got sin in my life, do, do I ignore it and just say, you know what, I, if I don't think about it, it's, it's, it's going to go away? Do I minimize it? Well, it's really not that bad, right? I mean, you see it around. Everybody's doing it. Do we wallow in it? Do we, do we accept it? Well, it's just the way, the way I am. You know, it's my thing. You know, everybody's different. That's the way I am. Do we accept it? Do we convince ourselves that it's not sin? Well, you know, back years ago, that was bad. But now, no, now it's very common, so it's not sin anymore. Do we blame shift? Well, it wasn't my fault, really. I mean, I, what could I do? It was somebody else. Do we, do we put it on them? Many of you know the story of, of David and Bathsheba. Found in, in 2 Samuel in chapter 11. And, and when we look at this story, we find that it's it's a, it's in the ultimate script of, of what lust, of, of sin, of deceit, of scheming, of murder, of cover-up. I mean, here you have, you have the king, okay? King of Israel, he goes up on the roof, looking at his kingdom, marveling, oh, look at what, what I've got here. Look at, look, at, look at all this. And marveling. And then his eyes shift down and he sees all over there bathing. And he inquires about her, takes that step, and then he doesn't care that she's married. He calls for her, gets her pregnant. 
Then he tries to cover it up. King David tries to cover it up. What's he do? He, call, he calls for her husband, Uriah, who is out on the battlefield fighting for him. Calls him, tells him to come. Why? Because he wants to cover it up. So he tries to convince him to go home and, and to get with his wife because, you know, she's pregnant. So if he gets with her now, then maybe nobody will notice, you know, the time thing. They didn't keep calendars the way they do now. So, you know, maybe. They... So what happens? Uriah, stand-up guy, he's like, no. He's devoted to his men. He's devoted to the king. He's like, no, how can I go home and like that when, when my brothers are, are fighting in battle? And he refuses to go home. And so David tries a couple of times to try to get him to, to go home and it doesn't work. He tries to cover this up. So what does he do? He writes this letter to the commander of the army and says, hey, put Uriah in the front line where it's completely dangerous. The chances of survival is zero. Put him on the front line. Then he gives the letter, seals it, gives the letter to Uriah and says, here, go take this to the Commander tells him, Uriah's taking this letter that's telling, you know, sealing his doom here. Takes it to the commander. David's involved in this murder. Why? To cover up his sin. I mean, talk about murder, adultery, deception, cover up. This is flat out sin, right? I mean, this is David. This is David. This is remember that young boy, that shepherd boy that is, you know, goes up against the Goliath, the big giant. That's him. I remember when I was in a, in a Sunday school class. I remember the uh, those those uh, felt boards, you know, and and you got that that uh, felt paper, and it's got that little image of David, the little boy, and then the big one of Goliath, and they stick it on there, and it's so big that the head kind of flops over that board, you know, and you're like, whoa, wow, he's like going up against this big giant, and, and he, he uh, picks up the three stones, and, and you know the story, and he, and he throws, flings a stone, and he kills Goliath, but he, he stands up, and he's like, you know, my God's going to conquer this, he's got that faith, this is the same person. And now God made him king. I mean, what was he thinking? We may be thinking that everything is going good in our lives, right? We may be looking at our lives. We may be saying, you know, life is good right now and family's good and I got things under control and I don't really need anything. And then it happens. And in a weak moment, we mess up, Right? Am I the only one in this? We mess up. Maybe we say something we shouldn't have said or, or we do something that we shouldn't have done or we offend someone or, or we offend God. Now what? Well, it's up to us to fix it, right? It's up to us to, to make it right. But how do we do that? How do we make that right? My first point here is that God wants us to confess our sins. God gives David a chance to confess. It's, uh, it's now been probably about, some, some think it's been about two years since Uriah's death. Now Bathsheba is his wife. They got this kid together. And uh, David's restless. He's irritable. Suffering nightmares. You know, sin takes a toll on our lives. Hiding something takes a toll on our lives. He hadn't repented. David hadn't repented for this. He's got, he's got, he's had two years. God's given him some time. Do it on your own. Repent. No, he's struggling. It's, it's affecting his life. And you say, well, how do you, how do you know this? How do you know that this was happening? The, the scripture there doesn't, doesn't really say this. In, in Psalms 32, David later on writes about this, kind of how he was feeling. In Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4, he says, David writes, When I refuse to confess my sin, my body 
wasted away, and I groaned all day long, day and night. Your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. You can sense there the, the torment. You can sense there what he was going through when he was carrying the sin, carrying the guilt of, of doing this thing. You may have done something or, or said something that wasn't very appropriate. Maybe it wasn't helpful. It may have been mean. Uh, maybe now you regret it. Maybe it came out in some selfish moment that you were going through something and it came out and, and it would be easy to cover it up and than it would to confess it to God. It would be easy to cover it up, but, but what does it do to you? See, when we have the Holy Spirit in us, and He starts to, to convict us, He starts saying, listen, it's not right, and we start feeling it. Yeah, and we, the more we suppress it, the more we put away, the more it might get numb and, and dull. But you know what? David was feeling this. Now, David's friends, he, uh, they knew Something was wrong, right? If you think about it. Bathsheba, she had friends. They knew she got pregnant. They knew Uriah hadn't come back. Probably put two and two together, you know. People knew. It's been two years, so there was probably talk around, around the uh, city that this had happened. Nobody would dare say anything. Why? Fear of death, you know what I mean? Yeah, why are you going to accuse the king of this kind of thing? No, I was hush-hush. It was a sin that was hush-hush. David knew, Bathsheba knew, everybody knew, nobody would say anything. And it burned on him, it gnawed at him. And he wouldn't confess it to God. God gave him those opportunities to confess it to God. And then two years, after two years, like I said, news spread. So at this time, David had opportunities to come clean with God. But he didn't. He had time to confess and ask God for forgiveness, and he didn't. When we let sin grow, it infects every area of our life. It infects our relationships. It infects our, our mood. It infects our, our physical state. It infects every area of our life when we don't take it to God and confess and come clean with God. The second point here is that God doesn't give up on us. God doesn't give up on us. God gave David a couple of years here to, to own up to it himself. He didn't. So God takes it to another level. God gives David another chance to confess by sending the prophet Nathan to him. Now, Scripture suggests that Nathan was more than just a, a prophet of God. Nathan knew David. He, uh, he knew about David's desire to build a temple for God. David's second son was possibly named after the prophet Nathan. So there was a relationship there. Nathan named David's second son Solomon. He named him. And then even after their encounter, which we're going to mention here, there was an ongoing relationship there. Nathan uh, was there and he, uh, he anointed Solomon king. Solomon, David's son, he anointed him king later on. So God didn't just send a prophet. He sent a friend to David. He sent a friend to go and, and talk to David. There's a good chance that Nathan even knew about what had happened beforehand and had not said anything. I mean, he was there. He was around there. He probably knew. And maybe he had struggled so, these couple of years. You know, should I say anything? Should I not? I, I don't know. I fear for my life. But who, who knows? Maybe he, didn't, maybe he prayed to God and, and, and it wasn't the right time. But now was the right time. One night, Nathan couldn't sleep, and God tells him, you need to go. Now's the time. You need to go to David, and you need to tell him. 
This is a big move. It's not just something easy because Nathan could have died here. You go in and you confront the king about a sin? That's something serious. But now is the right time. You know? Sometimes we feel like we look and we say, you know what, maybe I should do this. But when we check with God, we might say, you know what, maybe now is the right, not the right time. And we get with God and we ask God and then someday, one day God tells us, now is the right time. Now you need to go take care of this. And if we stop and say, well, and we look and what about this, what could happen here and what about all this? When God's telling you now is the right time, now is the right time. You go take care of it. So Nathan said, now is the right time for him. God gives us a chance to do it on our own, to confess. Now he's exposing this sin. Taking it to the next level with David. I want to tell you this. God is more concerned with our response than he is concerned with the actual sin that we do. He is more concerned with our... He was more concerned with David's response whether David would confess it and, and, and give it to God and ask for forgiveness than he was with the actual sin. See, it's a hard issue for God. He is concerned with how we respond. Do we go to him? We all mess up, right? But then do we go to him? My next point here is, are you a victim or a victor? There's evil in the world. We all know this. You may have been the victim at the hands of another person. And, and just like the Samaritan cared for the victim of an attack, God cares for those who have been harmed. And we are to care for those that are hurting. If you're hurting this morning, you came to the right place. Right? We're to care for each other. God wants to care for those that are hurting. But the enemy, he uses opportunities to blame us. Why? In order to keep us under the umbrella of being a victim. He wants us to be a victim. He wants us to remain victims. Now, in, in no way am I minimizing hurts and, and uh, injustices. Not at all. Please don't, don't think that I'm going there. We are to, to mourn with those that are mourned. We are to uh, weep with those who weep. We are to care for those that are hurting. Ecclesiastes uh, uh, 3, 4 says that there's a time to cry and a time to laugh a time to grieve and a time to dance. There's a time for mourning. There's a time uh, for sorrow. There's a time for weeping. There's a time. But God wants us to look inside. God cares about what we're going through. God desires us to not remain as a victim, but become a victor. See, when we stay in the victim mentality, we can't move forward with our healing. As much as we want to, we can't control other people. We can't control what they do. The only thing that we can do is we can take responsibility for ourselves. We see this even with Adam and Eve. And you know the story. They sin. They, they eat of this fruit. Then what happens? When God confronts them, what do they do? Adam blames God for giving him Eve. Then he blames Eve for giving him the fruit. Then Eve blames the serpent for, uh, for um, uh, deceiving her and, and lying to her and, and all that. They blame other people. God's... He wants them to take ownership of what they did. Right? I wonder how different the punishment would have been 
if both confessed and, and took ownership of their sins and asked for forgiveness right on the spot? I wonder. I don't know. Question. I mean, sin entered the world. Sin would still be here, but would things be any different? God wants us to take ownership. And so the prophet Nathan confronts David. Tells him a story. Nice, easy way to kind of ease into it instead of going in there, you know. Just tells him a story. Let's take a look at that. 2 Samuel 12. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David a story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many of sheep and cattle. Man, nice, right? Yeah, it's two guys. And look at the next one. He goes, The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and he grew it up with his children. He ate from the man's own plate. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup and he cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. Just look at that. You know, look how he framed that. David was a shepherd, right? Boy. David knew what it was like to, to take care of a little lamb. So he brings it home. He makes it, you know, personal here. Dave, you know what that's like, right? To take care of a little lamb. Remember the days when you were a kid? Remember how dear that was to you? And then look at the next. He says, then one day a guest arrived at home of a rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock and herd, the, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guests. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed. Any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Look at David go, huh? Yeah. David thought that he was in the clear, huh? Maybe when Nathan first got there, David was like, all right, what's going on? Where are you going with this? Then maybe he thought, oh, okay, this is kind of going for them. Yeah, let me, let me, let me show my anger. That's not right. It's injustice. What happened there? What happened there? I wonder why he was so furious. Maybe being overly upset about this would compensate for the guilt that he felt inside. If you ever watch the news, uh, it's common to hear stories of people that, uh, that are in power or influence. They condemn other people. And uh, they go after other people only to find out that they struggled with the same kind of situation later on. But they go real hard on other people and, and, and point fingers. What's that uh, thing where you say when you point the finger, there's three pointing back at you? Yeah. So David's saying, you know, he, he's like, burst out there. That guy should die. Come on, you know, type of thing. And so then what's, David's resp- or what's Nathan's response here? Yes. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. David's busted. King David got busted. The Lord, your God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. You had everything, David. If you wanted more, I'd give it to you, God's saying. Come on, I give you all. I give you everything. I can, you know, I give you more than that then. And look, verse 9. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with a sword of the Ammonites and you've stolen his wife. Oh, he makes that personal. He lets them know, I know specifically what you did. It's not, I know you sinned. I know specifically, exactly, and it's, it's out there now. 
This was a convicting moment for David. This was a moment that separated men from the boys. David could play the victim card here, right? You say, well, you know, I mean, look, I, in my defense, you know, and, and go that route, listen, you know, I, I mean, you don't know the whole story. You don't know my side of it, he could have said, right? Or he could have confessed. He could have get right with God. Now is his chance to get right with God. You know what? I'm going to come clean. What did he do? Let's take a look at David's response and God's quick answer. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord, period. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has, given, has forgiven you and you won't die of this sin. It's quick. I mean, that's, that's one verse. Boom. David said, I have sinned, period. No excuses, no, no this, no that. I have sinned. I take responsibility for what I did. And then Nathan, right away, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. Not, yes, but the Lord will forgive you. Or the Lord, let's ask the Lord to forgive you. No, the Lord had, has forgiven you. It's, he already has forgiven you. Just take note of that. God was waiting for David to own up to his sin. He had already been forgiven. He just needed to come to a point to own what he did, and then he would be told that he had already been forgiven. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, our sins had already been paid for. They had already been taken care of. All that was left was for us to accept that free gift of salvation. Right? And in order to do that, we needed to go open our hearts to Jesus and go to him. David wasn't in the clear. Yeah, he wasn't going to die. But he wasn't in the clear. See, there are consequences to disobedience. It's a reality. As much as we don't like consequences, they can often lead to change. Good change, beneficial change, consequences can lead to change. And there were consequences to David's sin. David would be told that his child with Bathsheba would have to pay the price for what David did. Take a look at verse 14. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord, by doing this, your child will die. Then Nathan leaves. The Bible says that Nathan left and went home. So what do you have to say? Let's go. Let's not try to comfort him. Let's not try to, you know, let, he's got to deal with this. Nathan left, went home. Okay, that works done. And now David's got to deal with this. The Bible says that, that the child got sick. And then the Bible says that David begged God, pleaded with him to spare his child. He went on a fast. He didn't eat anything. Laid flat on the ground on his stomach. Flat on the ground the entire time. Heard his child crying and moaning in the other room. And he's pleading with God, God, please save my son. Spend time, seven days of this. Seven days that he had to, he was getting with God, he was pleading with God, please, please spare my child. And you might think, and this was until the child died, and you might think, why did God take away or take out an innocent child like that? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that this wasn't the only time that an innocent person would have to be sacrificed for the sins of others. Right? Jesus, a thousand or so years later, God would have to do it again. 
Jesus led a sinless life, was a, was a spotless lamb, was as sinless as that little baby, as innocent. And he had to pay the price for our sins. But that's it, no more. He did it once and for all. And we talked about last week, done. David gets up then after his child dies. Gets up, the Bible says that he cleans himself off and, and then he goes and gets something to eat. And then the others are asking him, but it doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. You know, while the child was still alive and, and everybody's frantically trying to, to take care of this kid and, and trying to get, get him uh, revived again and trying to, to see what they could do, you know, he's over there mourning and, and, and pleading and, and crying. But now that the child has, di- has died, you know, he gets up, he cleans himself off, he's... he's I'm not going to say he's okay with it, but he's, you know, he's, he's, it's over now. He's accepted it. See, David puts things into perspective, and he reflects the peace that he has received from the Lord because his sins were now forgiven. And then he was able to go and comfort his wife. David, at some point later on, he writes about this experience, this whole experience, in Psalm 51. See, in order for David to experience true forgiveness, he had to take ownership of his actions. David had already been forgiven, but in order for him to accept it, he needed a change of heart. And we see in Psalm 51, the first part of it, he says, you know, have mercy on me, wash me clean. He says, purify me. He says to God, as he's struggling, knows that he had sinned and he's begging to God, maybe this is what he was, he was saying while his son was, was uh, dying. Maybe that's what he was saying. He was crying out to God. And then in verse 10, Look at what he writes here. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal or or a right spirit within me. He says, Create in me a clean heart. That should be our cry, right? Create in me a clean heart. When when you look at that, and when I was thinking about this, when it says, uh, when it it talks about uh, clean, you know, clean is, is actually, it's, it's, you could consider it a negative. You know, clean mean is, is to not have spots, to not be dirty. Something's clean, it's not dirty. See, it's not enough to not sin, to not do the things that displease God. You know, as, as long as I don't get drunk, as long as I don't yell at my spouse, as long as I don't cross that line, then then I'll be fine, right? Do we say that sometimes? As long as I don't do that, I'll be fine. That's not the case. See, being clean of heart, it comes by allowing God to renew a loyal spirit within us. See, being loyal is an ongoing action, right? It's an ongoing thing. Lord, Keep me striving to know you better. Keep me striving to serve you better. That should be our heart's cry. Keep me striving to love you better. Keep me striving to be an an example to others around me. Keep me striving to continue to make the right choices. That should be our heart's cry. And that's his cry. You created me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. He also says, look at it. It says, create in me a clean heart. He's pointing to himself. He's owning it. Create in me a clean heart. My heart's not clean, Lord. Create in me a clean heart. I can only work on my heart, not my neighbor's heart. I can only work on my heart. Renew a loyal spirit in me. Lord, take me back to my first love. 
Wouldn't that be our hearts? Guys, take me back to my first love. Remind me of what we had. David can say, remind me of when you were there for me when I was facing that giant. David's saying, remind me when you were there with me when I was hiding in the caves when King Saul was coming after me. Saying, take me back there. I was loyal to you back then and you were my all in all and I let it slip away, David's saying, but bring me back. I got sidetracked with the cares of this world, but bring me back. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Then he says, verse 11, do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David remembers how the Lord left King Saul after he had sinned. See, see the, the Lord told Saul, through the prophet Samuel, he said to go and attack the Amalekites and, and destroy all the things that they had, people, possessions, everything. Give him specific instructions. Destroy everything. And, and Saul spared uh, King Agag and, and he took the best of the animals and, and possessions. He took that and then when confronted, he said, no, but we're going to give you know the, to, that, that part to the Lord. And we took the best to give it to the Lord. He made excuses for what he did. You know, he didn't spare the children and the infants. No, he spared the, the best of the possessions. So you know where his heart was, right? Right? It wasn't the first time Saul had disobeyed God. And what was God's reaction? The Lord's response to Saul's sin is that the Lord regrets making Saul king. And then in uh, 1 Samuel 16, it says that the spirit of the Lord left Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrified him. That's what it says there. And so, so, so David's cry is, don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He's saying, he's coming clean. Not like Saul did where he, uh, he blamed, you know, he, he, he put it off on, well, this is why I did it. He had an excuse. No, David's like, I, I had sinned. I come to you. I take, I take ownership of, of what I did. And then David's cry is, I want to be in your presence, Lord. I want your Holy Spirit from me. And then he says in verse 12, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. He's saying, I want that joy back, Lord. I want that joy back. And in closing, if the team can come up here. David was living in condemnation for far too long. He wanted to be in the presence of God, period. He wanted to be there in the presence of God. How about you? Is that your cry this morning? We're going to sing that last song that, uh, that we sang. Now I want to ask you, do you want that joy back? Have you been living as a victim and not a victor? Maybe you, you need to confess or take ownership of, of some sin. And you need to go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I know that I've, I've got this, that I've been holding in. And I've, I've been ignoring it. I've been denying it. But I need to give it to you, Lord. Maybe you need to do that. I don't know. Maybe it's been gnawing at you and you're like, I got to take care of this. Maybe you've been stuck and not getting your prayers answered because you're holding back on something that you know the Lord wants you to give to Him. But you've been holding it back. And your prayers haven't been answered because of that. We want to give an opportunity. As we sing this song, I want you all to stand and let's worship. Let's do this song again. And if you need to go to God, you don't have to declare your sin to everybody. No, it's between you and God. If you need to come up to the altar, it's right here. If you stay in your seat, whatever you want to do, just don't lose this opportunity. Don't waste this opportunity 
to confess your sin to God. Take ownership of, you know, Lord, this has been bothering me. I did this. I know the Holy Spirit's been convicting me. And I need to give it to you, Lord. And I give it to you. Period. No excuses. No nothing. I give this to you. Let's take some time. Let's worship him. And deal with what the Holy Spirit's leading you to. You can't move forward unless you do that. Hey, this is Pastor Paul. I just wanted to take a moment and personally thank you for being a part of our service this morning. If something in this message touched you or you decided to commit your life to Jesus and you want to know more about furthering your relationship with Him, please reach out to me. Send me an email. I know that these are tough times and we could all use some encouragement. And one of those ways is to worship live together. Uh, if you live in the Grey New Gloucester, Maine area, we'd love for you to join us on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. And if you're not in this area and you don't currently have a church, I would encourage you to reach out to a church near you, a Bible preaching church. Make sure it is very important where you'll be encouraged and strengthened in your walk with Jesus. Hey, listen, Jesus loves you. We love you. Have a wonderful day.